الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبع فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise him and we glorify him As he ought to be praised and glorified And we pray for peace and for blessings On all his noble messengers And in particular on the last of them all The blessed prophet Muhammad Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam Respected imam brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I believe this is the first time For me to be here in Masjid al-Gufran in Taman Tun Dr. Ismail in Kuala Lumpur I thank you for your kind invitation to speak to you tonight on a subject which is of importance to all of us there are strange things happening in the world and we need to understand the world today and if we do not turn to our sources for that understanding the enemy is going to brainwash us with all kinds of false explanations and understandings and so tonight we look at the topic from Libya to Syria to Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam or from Tripoli to Damascus to Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam the reason why we have included Imam al-Mahdi is because we want to highlight our approach to the subject that we are looking for at this subject from the perspective of the Quran and of the ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam and in particular in the light of what you call ilmu akhiru zaman <coughs> and so let us turn now to our subject from Tripoli to Damascus to Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam we said that strange things are happening in the world and in Surah Al-Nahl of the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks and this is what he says وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ and we have sent down the book the Quran sent it down on thee O Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam تِبِيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ that this book might explain all things there has never been a stranger world than the dunya in which we are now living and if we do not turn to the Quran for the explanation of this dunya today we're going to suffer serious consequences for that and in this Quran there is guidance how should we live in this world how should we respond to events which are mysteriously unfolding in the world for example it's an open secret even schoolboys now know it that the US dollar is about to collapse But we've been saying that for the last 15 years. Where did we get that knowledge from? Is it that there is an angel coming to whisper in our ears? <laughs> or is it a jinn? No. <laughs> we knew that the 
US dollar will collapse that it has to collapse it must collapse because of our study of ilmu akhirul zaman or what is called islamic eschatology in this quran there is guidance how do we respond to this chaotic world of money and now everybody minting dinar and dirham even the chinese non-muslims are din minting dinar and dirham now in penang no? 15 years ago ours was a voice in the wilderness hmm? that explanation and that guidance in the quran has come as rahmah from allah and woe unto those who do not turn to the Qur'an and accept the Rahmah But those who do And who locate it and who follow it Bushra lahum Good news and Glad tidings for such people Who are so faithful To the book of Allah For they will understand what others cannot New faith times will be the last to understand <laughs> And they will succeed when others will not we pay a price when we do not turn to the Quran in Surah Al-Furqan Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places these words on the lips of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam which surah? Surah Al-Furqan Ba'ad a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ And the Messenger of Allah said Ya Rabb O oh my Rabb, my Lord God Inna qawmi, surely my people That's you and I Inna qawmi takhazu Hadha al-Qur'an mahjura Surely my people have forsaken this Qur'an Surely my people have abandoned this Qur'an That's a terrible complaint And so now let us look at the world today In which we have these mysterious Arab uprisings taking place And look to the Qur'an and to he who was sent to teach the Qur'an For that which explains we have our brother Jamaluddin here with us tonight Some five months ago at the University of Malaya He organized my first lecture On an Islamic view of the current Arab uprisings And today we are updating that subject Because of the events which have occurred since then We will pause for this Azan of Salatul Isha and then we'll continue for some time after that And then we'll have a question and answer session With the permission of the Imam And then we'll have the Salatul Isha Insha'Allah Was it by accident That one people One Christian people Launched Jihad Yes, Jihad To liberate the Holy Land they call it the Crusades They were holy wars, so jihad No other Christians joined them in it And on their way from Europe To the Holy Land, they fought against their own Christian brothers The Byzantine Eastern Orthodox Christians What is it that explains Europe's Obsession with liberating the Holy Land Is it by accident Or does it form part Of a bigger plan The Crusades continued For hundreds of years Until eventually When General Allenby Entered into Jerusalem At the head of a British army And with Muslims fighting in that army Defeating the Ottoman Islamic Empire General Alambi entered into Jerusalem in October or November 1917 And declared today 
the crusades have ended. In other words, a modern secular Britain was still pursuing a holy war launched by a Pope, a Roman Catholic Pope in Rome. What is it that explains? Is this an occurrence that is happening by accident? And then after that, Britain issued the Balfour Declaration. That is the intention of the British government to work for the establishment of a Jewish national home in the Holy Land. Is this by accident? And then after that, Britain becomes the mandate power controlling the Holy Land. And during that time, between 1918 and 1948, for 30 years, the Jews are allowed to return to the Holy Land. Not Banu Israel. Banu Israel are still in Yemen, and in Iraq, and in Iran, and in Morocco. No, 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 these are white people who become Jews. They have no genetic links at all with Arabs. They're not cousins of the Arabs. They're not from Ishaq alayhi salam. And the Arabs are from Ismail alayhi salam. And so genetically linked as cousins. No. These European people have no genetic links whatsoever with Banu Israel, but they're Jews. And when in 1948 a state of Israel was born in the Holy Land and the Jews now recover Jerusalem as their own. Is this happening by accident? And then from 1948 to this date, first of all it was Britain who supported and protected the state of Israel. And then the United States of America took over. And Israel grows and grows and grows in strength. Until Israel today is a superpower. Is this happening by accident? Shall we simply eat roti chanai and go home and go to sleep? Is that what Allah gave us a rational faculty for? Or is there some explanation for it? And we say that there is an explanation. Not only are these events occurring in the Holy Land, but they could not have occurred unless Europe had experienced a strange, a mysterious scientific and technological revolution that was absolutely unique in human history. Nothing to compare with it. One people deliver to the world and are continuing to deliver to the world this mysterious scientific and technological revolution which gives them a power that none can rival. Is this happening by accident? And then they apply that power to military technology and they attack at the point of a sword and they occupy and they colonize the rest of the world and they destroy the Khilafah oh but the Khilafah is a part of Islam is this happening by accident? and they do not decolonize until they have done some work they take the money that Allah gave to us the money that is the sunnah, sunnah money, the gold and silver coins, the dinar and dirham, they take it out of the market. They establish an international monetary fund and they make it in that fund prohibited for anybody to use gold and silver as money, not even Dr. Mahathir knew that. And they replace it with this bogus this fraudulent and this utterly haram paper currency. Is this happening by accident? And the paper money functions 
as a vehicle for the massive exploitation of the wealth of the masses. And so part of the world now becomes fantastically wealthy and the rest of the world growing poorer and poorer. Is this happening by accident? Who are those who are growing wealthy? Like you know, little Israel around the corner there, Singapore. Those that are growing wealthy are those who support the state of Israel. Whether they do it openly as Singapore or they do it secretly as Saudi Arabia, they are the supporters of Israel. And so they are on the gravy trade. They live well. They are growing more and more wealthy. And who are those who are growing poorer and poorer? Those in whose hearts there is faith in Allah. Sincere faith in Allah. Those who will never bow their head to oppression. Like Indonesia. Like Bangladesh. Like Pakistan. Like Egypt. Like the Turkish countryside, not the Turkish cities. They grow poorer and poorer and poorer. Is this happening by accident? And not only do they give us this revolution in the world of finance, but the revolution also in the market. We never had riba. We used to have a few money lenders lending money on interest and people despise them. And they give to us a banking system. And that banking system now lends money on interest. And not only lending on interest in order to grow wealthy at the expense of others, but no. When you read John Perkins' book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, you know that sometimes they lend you money on interest to enslave you. Even a schoolboy knows that now. Are these things happening by accident? There's also a revolution in our social life. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, the time would come when women would be dressed and yet be naked. Has that come today? Is it happening by accident? Well then what is the explanation for these mysterious events which are unfolding in the world today? And therefore what is the explanation of the Arab uprising? They call it the Arab Spring in which we have had the events of Tunisia and the departure of the President uh, Zainuddin bin Ali with that uprising, popular uprising. And then, what's his name now? We've forgotten it, eh? the Egyptian one. <laughs> Hosni Mubarak. In the popular Egyptian uprising. And now we see uprisings taking place in other parts of the Arab world as well. What is going on? What is the explanation? Our perspective is to look at the subject from the Quran and from the Ahadith of Prophet Muhammad And when we do that, the first thing that we recognize is we are dealing with the subject of Akhirul Zaman or Islamic eschatology. Maybe tomorrow the scholars of Islam are going to wake up and turn to this subject. But as of today, nothing has succeeded so far. They don't want to touch the subject. Why? I thought perhaps it's because of methodology. Methodology. An incapacity of turning to the Quran to locate that explanation because of defective methodology. And so now let us spend a few moments on methodology because we are growing old and tomorrow it's our younger ones, the students, who are going to take over. And we want to leave with them this methodology that they can take the subject further. 
In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches methodology at the very beginning. I'm going to be rapid now because you probably heard my previous lectures. He ordered Adam alayhi salam to bow down. Sorry, he ordered the angels to bow down, make sijda before Adam alayhi salam. And then Allah says, Fasajadu illa iblis. And they all prostrated except Iblis. If we use the wrong methodology, the wrong one, they will, we will study this verse in isolation. And we will come to the conclusion that since the order was given to the angels and they all bow down except this one, the implication is that Iblis is an angel. The Christians came to that same conclusion. And so they gave us the concept of a fallen angel. But in Islam, angels don't fall down. No. If we use this wrong methodology of taking a verse of the Quran or taking a hadith in isolation, you know, the lazy man's methodology, we can make a very embarrassing mistake. And Allah teaches us a lesson at the very beginning of the Quran because he's not deficient in the use of language. No. He says, Fasajadu illa iblis. They all prostrated except Iblis. He's, he's used this language to teach methodology. Usul tafsir. If we use the correct methodology, in which we look to the totality of the Quran, not just one verse or one hadith. As we study the Quran, we find that, but wait a minute, angels do not have free will. Angels do not have the capacity to choose. No. When an angel is given an order, he has no choice but to obey. وَيَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ says Allah in the Quran. They do what they are ordered to do. But this one disobeyed. <laughs> and so he couldn't be an angel. And there are other verses of the Quran which as we study them, we realize, oh, oh, we made a mistake. And so when we study the totality of the guidance, then we get the correct understanding. When we go to Surah Al-Kafi of the Quran, you say Kafi, we say Surah Al-Kafi. Allah says, وَكَانَ مِنَ الْجِنِّ And so when you study Islamic eschatology, when you study Ilm al Zaman, you got homework to do, it's not going to be easy. You have to stay with your subject for a long, long time. You have to plant before you can reap, before you can grasp this most difficult of all subjects located in the Quran. Ilm al Zaman. You have to locate what is the central theme around which everything else revolves. And hold on to that and never part from it. That central theme of course is wa innahu it can be read as la ilmul lisa'a or la adamun lisa'a. Both are correct. That he Nabi Isa alayhi salam when he returns his return will be the sign of all signs of the last hour. So everything connected with the subject of Ilmu Akhiru Zaman revolves around the central theme of the return of the true Messiah. But Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam told us that before the true Messiah returns, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will release into the world a false messiah, al masihu dajjal And when we study the subject of al masihu dajjal and we also study the subject of Ya'juj and Ma'juj or Gog and Magog, now we get the explanation. The Quran now begins to explain to us what's happening in the world today. We don't have the time today to go over that long subject, but we have my book at the back there, Jerusalem in the Quran, which was published 10 years ago, and which explained this subject. We also have it in Bahasa, uh, Jerusalem, D, Dalam, Al Quran, in which we get the explanation from the Quran and from the Hadith of what is happening in the world today and in particular in the Holy Land. The Jal is the mastermind. He is the mastermind who delivered the modern scientific and technological revolution. He is the mastermind who engineered the liberation from the perspective of the Jews of the Holy Land. The restoration of a state of Israel in the Holy Land. The return of the Jews to Jerusalem to reclaim it as their own. And the growth of that Israel to the state in which it is today poised to replace the United States of America as the third and last ruling state of the Jal three ruling states. Where did Imran Hussein get this knowledge from? We never heard it from anybody else. We never read it in any book. Huh? No expert in international affairs ever spoke about this. This is the benefit of going to the book of Allah. This is the benefit of going to Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. And don't expect that the answers are going to come to you overnight. It's a long, long process. Israel wants to rule the world. Why does Israel want to rule the world? They said, and now you can see the lies. When you understand the subject, you can see the lies. They said, 60, 70 years ago, all that we want to do is to create a home for the Jews. That's all. In the Holy Land. That's Balfour Declaration. That was a lie. You're not creating a home for the Jews. You're creating a state that will one day seek to rule the world. Are we not going to fall for your lies? Not Muslims. Why does Israel want to rule the world? Answer, because al masih al-Dajjal, in order for the Jews to accept his claim that he is indeed the true Messiah, he must rule the world from Jerusalem, from a state of Israel. Otherwise, nobody is going to believe him. In order for the Jews to believe that this is indeed the true Messiah, the Jal, he's got to get rid of this bogus paper money. Every Jew knows that this is bogus, this is fraudulent, this is haram. Uh, maybe the Muftis will know it tomorrow. And Israel has to bring back gold and silver as money. If Israel does not have gold and silver as money, no Jew will accept this man as the Messiah. And so the world is going to come back to gold and silver as money. You're not going to get this in any textbook of international monetary economics, no. No university in the world will tell you this, no. 
that there is a tomorrow which is coming in which mankind are going to turn back to gold and silver as money. Even Malaysia. And you're not going to have your ringgit anymore. No university is going to tell you that. How do we know it? Because we turn to the Quran and we turn to Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. If Israel is to rule the world, then Israel will have to begin by ruling the Arab world. I'm sure you'll agree with me. Israel will have to subdue the Arabs. Israel will have to establish an Israeli political and economic dominion over the Arab world because that's the beginning of ruling the world and so now we're beginning to see some light now that we have understood from our Islamic eschatological perspective Al Muakhir Zaman that Israel wants to rule the world we know that Israel will have to subdue the Arabs the plan began with the first ruling state Britain and the establishment of Pax Britannica can you get me a copy of Jerusalem and the Quran please and also Gold Dinar and Gog and Magog these three Pax Britannica Britain ruled the world was that by accident? no it's part of the Jazz plan and when Britain ruled the world there was something called the British Sterling Pound thank you Jazakallah the British Sterling Pound which became the international currency and those of you who have read Jerusalem in the Quran you already know the subject and then came the second ruling state the United States of America and the sterling pound is no longer the international currency now it's the US dollar is, is this change taking place by accident or is there something which explains it in order for Britain to become the ruling state Britain had to wage great wars Britain was a naval power supreme in the world Britain controlled every single strategically important naval port in the whole world that's why they took Singapore for its naval importance in order for the United States to replace Britain as the next ruling state in the world United States had the great wage big wars the first world war without the United States Britain would have lost the war the second world war without the United States Hitler would have won the war and so it follows that if Israel is to succeed the United States as the third and last ruling state in the world Israel will have to wage big wars and the first target of Israel's wars must be the Arabs it's a simple logical understanding nothing so complex here yeah. how did we get from the first to the second and then to the third in this book it's a Malay artist who designed it you see there, there are three blue circles the first one there is a piece of the hadith which is in Sahih Muslim in which Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said that when the Dajjal is released he will live on earth 
for 40 days. Yawmun Kasana, a day which would be like a year. I don't know how long a day like a year is going to be. I am not involved in any calculations. Do not say that Imran Hussein said that a day like a year is going to last 1,000 years because that is false. I have never said that. All that I'm saying is that a day like a year is going to be a very long period of time. That's all. And in that day like a year, I recognize, I recognize Pax Britannica. Britain rules the world. And then came the second one, Yawmun Kashahr, a day which is like a month. How long is a day like a month? I don't know. And I'm not involved in any mathematical calculations. No. What I do know is that a day like a month is going to be a much shorter period than a day which is like a year. And during that second stage, the world noticed, the world witnessed rather, the transfer of power from Pax Britannica to Pax Americana. America rules the world. When we say America rules the world, it does not mean that America has to rule every square inch of Kalantan. That's not ruling the world. What we mean by ruling the world is that there is no rival to your power. No rival. Or no combination of rivals to your power. Hmm? That's a ruling state. And then we said, he will live on earth for 40 days. Yawmun Kasana, a day which is like a year. Yawmun Kashahar, a day which is like a month. Yawmun Kajumah, a day which is like a week. And we said, that day which is like a week will, will witness the transfer of power from the United States of America to Israel. And then the world will experience Pax Judaica. Pax Judaica. This is the most important point made in this book. It was made for the first time in this book. If Israel is to rule the world, therefore Israel has to wage big wars, like the United States did, like Britain did. And the first target of Israel's wars will have to be the Arabs, to subdue the Arabs. But in the Arab world, there is one country which is more important than all the rest. Which one is that? It's Egypt. Why Egypt? Again, it's only Ilmu Akhirul Zaman which can answer that question. In the Bible, they rewrote, they put in with their own hands in the Bible, in the Torah, that the Holy Land extends from the river of Egypt, the river Nile, to the river Euphrates. Hmm? All of this is the Holy Land. That's false. When we go to the Quran, and we go to the ahadith of Nabi Muhammad wasalam, we know that this is false but it's there so for Dajjal to convince the Jews that he is indeed the Messiah the state of Israel will have to extend its frontiers to encompass the biblical frontiers the false biblical frontiers of the Holy Land and so now we can understand why NATO is in Iraq, up to the Euphrates, occupying this territory, because Israel has to reach the Euphrates. But what about Egypt? An Egyptian sent me an email two weeks ago to say, Sheikh Imran, the Israeli embassy 
in Egypt is never located on the east bank of the river Nile no all the other embassies are there but not Israel the Israeli embassy in Cairo is always on the west bank of the river Nile why? because the Jews believe that's their land so how can they establish their embassy in their land? Hmm? the territory which is known as the Eastern Delta in the Quran the Eastern Delta is referred to as Misr today the whole of Egypt is known as Misr but not the Quran this Eastern Delta is where the Jews lived for a few hundred years when Yusuf alayhi salam was taken they took him out of the well and they sold him in Egypt they sold him for a few measly dirhams hmm? and then he became minister in charge of agriculture food production food preservation and then the whole of Banu Israel were brought to Egypt and they lived in that eastern delta for a few hundred years and that's why they wrote in the Torah that this is a part of the Holy Land if Israel is to launch an attack on Egypt to take that territory you can't do it with only drones and helicopter gunships <laughs> and missiles landing from the air you have to launch a ground invasion to take that territory and so now we can understand at least this part of the Arab uprisings that while Tunisia and Egypt were spontaneous popular uprisings where there may have been a Zionist little hint and a push here and there to help it along but the people rose up on their own as well against oppression but in Libya it was not like that this was not an uprising this was a long planned armed insurrection not an uprising NATO worked very hard and NATO had friends in Qatar <laughs> and in Saudi Arabia to help them and in Turkey to help them to get the arms into Libya in advance and then when the call was given the armed uprising takes place NATO would not have succeeded and NATO of course is a Zionist organization and someone should probably explain that to our brother the Turkish Prime Minister he doesn't seem to know it NATO the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is a the armed wing of Zionism a Zionist organization NATO needed a Security Council resolution to allow them to attack Libya from the sky and when the resolution came before the Security Council Russia and China decided to abstain from the vote knowing full well that the resolution will now pass yeah the resolution will now pass and that's the end of Gaddafi and the, the regime in Libya why did Russia and China act in the way that they did we'll let you know inshallah in a moment after the Azan of Isha when the matter came before the Security Council of the United Nations a resolution to permitting the use of military intervention NATO in Libya Russia and China abstained from the vote knowing full well that the resolution will now be adopted and that is the end of the Libyan government it's only a matter of time why did Russia and China act in this way is there collusion between Russia and the Zionists between China and the Zionists or is there 
another explanation? It's a very important question for us to seek to answer. On my website, there's an essay uh, in which I've attempted to answer that question. Uh, Lessons from the Zionist attack on Libya. That's the title of the essay. We need not go into that explanation now. What are the implications of the success of NATO and of the Muslims in Libya who launched the attack and succeeded at least in Tripoli in bringing down the government of Muammar al-Qasafi and then winning recognition, diplomatic recognition around the world, even Malaysia, one of the first states to recognize the new regime in Libya was Malaysia. All the pro-American governments in the world quickly recognized. But surprisingly, Russia also recognized and China also recognized very quickly. The ones who held out and are still holding out are the ones who truly have sincerity in their hearts. And that is Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. I am not going to recognize this government. Evo Morales in Bolivia. I'm not going to recognize this government. Hmm? And some other South American states. The implications of the fall of the Libyan government is that NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, will now be in Libya for the next 25 years. They're not going to leave. They wanted Libya for a particular reason that our Muslim brothers could not understand. Eating halwa. They wanted to be in Libya because Egypt is the target. And you have to send in ground troops into Egypt. You can't do it with drones as you're doing it in Pakistan. And so now with the success in Libya, when Israel launches her attack on Egypt, Israel will launch the attack from the east and NATO will uh, launch the attack from the west ground troops. This is in addition to the air and this is in addition to a naval blockade of Egypt. Hmm? Will the Egyptian government survive? Will the Egyptian state survive? Given the pathetic state of Islamic scholarship today because it's the ulama they are the guides of the Ummah, not the excellencies, the ministers of government, not the newspapers and not the television sets. The ulama of Islam, these are the guides of the Ummah. And given the pathetic state of Islamic scholarship today, I see no reason why it's going to hurt the Egyptians. And we have a few Egyptians here tonight, I believe. It's going to hurt the Egyptians for me to say this. I don't see any obstacle in the way of their achieving their objective in Egypt. But they're not going to stop with simply seizing the Eastern Delta. They're going to break up Egypt into small bits and pieces so that the small bits and pieces can never pose a threat to Israel. A word for the so-called Mujahideen who waged the struggle against Gaddafi. I hope you're listening to me and I hope all the other allies of NATO including the Turkish Prime Minister are listening to me. Here is a verse of the Quran and you do well to study the Quran. In Surah Al-Ma'idah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a statement of profound importance. And in this verse, he explains to us the world today. Listen one more time. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you who have faith in Allah. 
لا تتخذ اليهود والنصارى أولياء. Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. If we use the lazy man's methodology, the defective methodology, we will come to the conclusion that Allah is speaking about all Christians. And he's speaking about all Jews. This is a lazy man's methodology. But when you use the proper methodology, you see something else. Or look at that other verse in Surah Al-Baqarah. وَلَن تَرْضَى عَنْكَ الْيَهُودِ وَلَن نَصَارَى حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ And the Jews and the Christians will never rest contented until they get you to follow them in their way of life, their religion. Is Allah speaking about all Jews? And is he speaking about all Christians? Even an elementary study of the Quran, not a sophisticated study, would yield immediately so many different verses of the Quran which makes it clear that Allah is not speaking of all Jews and he is not speaking of all Christians. For example, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, وَلَتَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارَةً And you will most certainly find in time to come that those who will be closest to you in love and affection will be those who say we are Christians. The people who are closest in love and affection for you and you cannot be friends with them? Where has reason gone? <laughs> And there are several other verses of the Quran. And so now, we dismiss that nonsense. That when Allah says, do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies, we dismiss the nonsense that he's speaking about all Jews and he's speaking about all Christians. No. Well then, if he's not speaking about all Jews and all Christians, which Jews and which Christians is he speaking about? The Turkish Prime Minister better listen, because he doesn't know the subject. He doesn't know the subject. The answer is in the words which follow. Do not take such Jews and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other. The Quran is anticipating a time to come when part of the Christian world and part of the Jewish world are going to effect a mysterious reconciliation. I wish I could give this lecture in Bahasa, you know. <laughs> I have to use the English language. That part of the Christian world and part of the Jewish world are going to effect a mysterious reconciliation. You have to take this lecture and give it in Bahasa so the people will understand it. And when they effect this mysterious reconciliation, in which the Vatican will play a critical role, exonerating the Jews from responsibility for the crucifixion. Oh, come on, Mr. Pope. Nobody ever said that all the Jews were responsible. Come on, Mr. Pope. The Quran says, فَأَمَنَ الطَّائِفَةُ مِنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلُ وَكَفَرَ الطَّائِفَةُ some of the Jews believed in Jesus and others rejected him. So when a Jew believed in Jesus as the Messiah, does it mean he's no longer a Jew? Come on, Pope, I want an answer. 
just because I accept Jesus as a Messiah, I'm no longer a Jew? What nonsense is this? Nobody ever said that all the Jews were responsible. But we do say that the establishment, the rabbis, they are the ones. And they did it in the name of Judaism. Not in their own name. And so every Jew has to part company from what they did. Otherwise you're part of the responsibility for it. Hmm? And so when you see that mysterious reconciliation taking place, which happened in Europe, and then you see a Jewish Christian alliance emerging, as has happened in Europe, Allah is saying, these are the Jews, and these are the Christians, with whom I am prohibiting you from maintaining friendly ties and becoming their allies. You may say today, we are friends of America. I'd love to see you when you're in the grave. Oh yes, Excellency. I'd love to see you when you're in the grave, when you have to defend that statement. When that Jewish Christian alliance emerges, Allah says, Do not be friends and allies of these people. Allah is not speaking about an individual Jew who has a Christian as his neighbor and the two are friends of each other, not at all. He's talking about an, an alliance between two people. That alliance has come into being today, it is the Zionist Jews and Zionist Christians who have forged that alliance. They're the ones who gave us the International Monetary Fund. They are the ones who gave us this bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper money. And please read this book. The Gold Dinar and Silver Dirham Islam and the Future of Money. They are the ones who gave us the United Nations organization. Controlled by the Security Council. And in the Security Council, the Zionists are in control. So Palestine wants to become a member of the UN. And when Palestine becomes a member of the UN, you are now ob obliged to obey the Charter. And the Charter says, Allah is not Al-Akbar. The Charter says the supreme authority in the world, in all matters pertaining to international peace and security, resides with the Security Council. When the Security Council says, stand up, you're going to stand up. When they say, sit down, you're going to sit down. How are you going to answer to Allah for that massive betrayal? of Allah and his message. But Palestine wants to become a member of the Security Council. I mean the United Nations. وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُمْ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ says Allah. Whoever turns to them for friendship and alliance, as Saudi Arabia has done, as Turkey has done, a member of NATO, as the elite in Pakistan have done, as the elite in Egypt has done, as Jordan have done. Huh? Whosoever turns to them for friendship and alliance, for innahu minhum, Allah says in the Quran, you've lost your Islam. You've lost your Islam. You now belong to them. Inna Allah la yahdil qawma zalimin. Surely Allah provides no guidance for wicked people. And so the trademark of that alliance is going to be wickedness. And what did they do in Libya? These brothers of ours who were taken for a ride, who had eyes and yet could not see, they joined the alliance with NATO. They called for NATO to come and bomb. And now they are riding triumphantly. That we have liberated Libya. No, you've not. NATO is in control. And you'll have to answer to Allah on, last, on the last day because you lost your Islam. Not only that, you now have a rope around Egypt's neck. And that rope is tightening now. Because Egypt is now in a perilous situation. NATO will attack from the west, Israel will attack from the east.
that Jewish Christian alliance, the Zionist alliance, can be identified even further in the Quran with Gog and Magog. And this is my book on Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog are in the Quran. And you better study that subject of Gog and Magog. Because they are the ones who control power in the world today, Yajuj and Majuj. And if you follow them, if you remain under their umbrella, what are the consequences? Sahih Bukhari and the hadith was repeated four times. But you'll hardly ever find anyone mentioning that hadith from the member or even in Charama. That on judgment day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to Adam alayhi salam, take out the people for Jahannam. This is Hadith al-Qudsi, Sahih Muslim, Hadith al-Qudsi, direct speech of Allah. Adam alayhi salam will ask how many are they, O Allah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reply and say, out of every 1,000, take how many? 999. You know the hadith, mashallah. Out of every 1,000, take 999 for Jahannam. The companions of the Prophet والسلام, were terrified when they heard that. And he, the Prophet, smiled and said to them, Good news for you. The one for Jannah will be from you. But the 999 will be Ya'juj and Ma'juj, will be Ahlu Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And so you're going to have a global society in Akhirul Zaman. And that global society, which comes into being in consequence of globalization, would be the global society of Gog and Magog. And once it embraces you, it's going to take you into the hellfire. Let us now leave Libya and come to Syria. We don't have time for Yemen. We don't have time for Bahrain. We don't have time for Saudi Arabia. Syria. Syria is so complex a case. You cannot say that it is an uprising because the Zionists are actually recruiting people, paying them, arming them to go and fight in Syria. The Turkish the Turkish forces are also doing the same, instigating people to go and fight and providing them with arms and weapons. This is therefore not a popular uprising. This is like Libya, an insurrection. But Syria also has a very large Sunni Muslim community and we can now recognize that it was not by accident that the Sunni Muslims of Syria in consequence of French strategy were kept oppressed and suppressed by a sectarian Shia movement, the Alawi, for how many years now? Brutally suppressed and oppressed. And so when the time comes and they can smell the breath of freedom, there will be certainly an element of popular uprising as well in Syria a quest for freedom from oppression 
and sectarian domination by the Alawi. The Alawi are a, a branch of the Shia. And Iran has not acted wisely on the subject of Syria. The Syrian Muslims, the Sunni Muslims of Syria, are now openly accusing Iran of arming and supporting the regime in Syria to succeed in its oppression and suppression of the present uprising. As a consequence, we can easily anticipate that if these uprisings in Syria were to succeed and the majority Sunni Muslims were to replace the present regime, that is Arawi, there are going to be significant negative repercussions for Iran. The Zionists are not unaware of that. Their objective is to isolate Iran and they want to take away a very important strategic partner of Iran, namely Syria. It would have been more sensible of Iran to publicly advise the sectarian Shia Syrian regime that you need you need to share power with the Sunni Muslims who are our brothers in faith and who have been long suppressed and oppressed and it would have been very wise it would have been excellent diplomacy on the part of Iran to intervene and to support the cause of justice in Syria and in so doing the Syrian uh, Sunni Muslims would not have fallen as they are falling unfortunately into the same NATO trap there are implications in Syria I don't know whether the insurrection will succeed Russia and China have just vetoed. It didn't come to the Security Council. It was vetoed before it came to the Council. A similar resolution as they had on Libya. So with the Russian and China, the vote was nine, for nine against two. With the Russian and Chinese veto, it means that there is no possibility for NATO to intervene militarily. And therefore, there is a likelihood, I don't know, the likelihood that the regime would survive in Syria. But from our Islamic eschatological perspective, we don't look at the subject merely in the short term perspective. We will focus, and I hope my students in different parts of the world will concentrate on this. We will focus on Damascus in this context. That the sign of all signs of Akhir zaman is the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. The Pope doesn't know it, but we know it because of the Hadith in Sahih Muslim. That when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns, he's going to return in Damascus. And so events that are unfolding in Damascus are of supreme importance for us. That prior to the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam, Imam al Mahdi Masimaj. And when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns, Imam al-Mahdi will be in Damascus, in the masjid. It is becoming fashionable by some of the intelligentsia in Pakistan, for example, to discount 
the ahadith on Imam al Mahdi as fabrication because Alama Iqbal, or Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, dismissed them in his book entitled The Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam. And Ibn Khaldun also dismissed them as fabrications, which is why Ibn Khaldun is so, much, so famous in the Western world. Now you can understand why. Because he dismissed the ahadith on Imam al Mahdi as fabrications. What they didn't understand is that there's a divine method. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Messiah the first time, He raised the man to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. That man was his cousin. Nabi Yahya alayhi salam, the Prophet John. And when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returned as an adult to the Holy Land, it was in front of Nabi Yahya alayhi salam that he came. And Nabi Yahya alayhi salam says, here he is, this is the man you've been waiting for. This is the Messiah. The divine method of positive identification. History repeats itself, but Ibn Khaldun missed the bus, and Dr. Muhammad Iqbal missed the bus, and may Allah bless them, they are very great scholars. We are nothing compared to them. And so when, the, when the Messiah is to come back, Allah raises him in to play the same role that Nabi Yahya alayhi salam played. And that is the rationale for Imam al Mahdi. And when Nabi, Nabi Isa alayhi salam descends in the masjid, in Damascus, not Tripoli, Imam al Mahdi will be in the masjid. They'll be ready preparing for salat. And before the salat will commence, he comes down. And Imam al Mahdi will look at him and say, This is the Messiah positive identification repeating itself the divine methodology before that happens Imam al-Mahdi has to proclaim himself to be the Mahdi in Mecca you may have heard my lecture it's on YouTube when he proclaims himself as the Mahdi in Mecca is going to be attacked by an army from Sham. Which means that the believers are not going to be in control of Damascus. From now until that day. <laughs> are you following me? He's going to be attacked by an army from Sham. Damascus today is not only ruled by a sectarian Shia movement that is oppressing the support, the, the, the majority Sunni Muslims, brutal, brutal suppression. But also Damascus today is the supreme voice in the Arab world of Arab nationalism, taking over from Baghdad. Arab nationalism is a rival to Islam. Hmm? And so an army is going to come out of Sham to attack Imam al-Mahdi. And when an army crosses Medina, going south to Mecca, the earth will open and swallow that army. This is the third of the three, Khusuf. Hmm? Ten major signs of the last day. Number one, Dajjal. Number two, Gog and Magog. Number three, the return of the son of Mary. Number four, Dukhan. Number five, the battle of number six, that the sun would rise from the west. Number seven, eight, and nine, three earthquakes. But these are earthquakes in which the earth sinks down. So they're called Khusuf. One in the east, one in the west, and the third in Arabia, not Tamansri, UK. Arabia and when this takes place that army is going to be swallowed this is line sign number nine and number ten is that the fire will come out of Yemen 
And let us pause for a moment to pay tribute to our brother Rahimahullah Sheikh Anwar Al Awlaki. I don't think there's need to say more than one statement about Anwar Al Awlaki. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam said, My ummah is like the rain. My ummah is like the rain. I do not know which shower is better, the first or the last. Anwar Olaki belongs to the last shower. That is his status. May Allah grant him Jannah. So these are the ten major signs of the last day. And now that army is swallowed by the earth. <coughs> Damascus has one more importance. And that is that Dajjal is also going to be in Damascus. When Nabi Isa alayhi salam comes down, Imam al-Mahdi is in the masjid. The salat takes place. After the salat is over, Imam al-Mahdi, the Nabi Isa alayhi salam would say, open the gates because the masjid is barricaded. And Dajjal will be outside. And when Dajjal sees Nabi Isa alayhi salam, his fright will be such that he'll melt the way salt melts in water. And so we do not treat Damascus so easily. We do not analyze the uprisings and the insurrection in Damascus, in Syria, from a limited perspective. Rather, we're looking at it in a long-term perspective. What's going to happen between now and that moment when Nabi Isa Islam returns? We know that Israel will have to wage a big wars. Maybe we, try, we, we, we uh, postpone our international Islamic retreat because we're expecting those wars to commence soon, maybe within the next one year. But before I end, I want to direct your attention to the fact that Britain did not give way to the United States as a second ruling state before Britain was placed in a situation where she was facing defeat. Germany in the First World War used a new weapon of war never used before. Germany used the submarine. And German submarines had marooned Britain. And Britain had enough food to survive for probably another two weeks. Britain was going to lose the war had the United States not intervened. I say this to you so that you would think. The Zionists then went to the United States. Well, first of all, they went to Britain and said, let's make a deal. You're going to lose the war. Let's make a deal. So Britain asked, what do you want? We want Jerusalem. We want the Holy Land. And that's how the Balfour Declaration came out. And then the Zionists went to work and they rode over, what's his name again? They went to the Ford, Ford Moloka, Henry Ford, the most popular American at that time, more popular than the president. And he was opposing American intervention in the war. And yet the Zionists succeeded and they brought the United States into the war. And so I say to you, that in order for Israel to replace the United States, a trap has to be set for the United States. And the United States has to suffer a fall 
a big fall in consequence of which it will be clear the United States can no longer be considered the ruling state in the world part of that trap of course is the deliberate pre-planned demolition of the US dollar the deliberate pre-planned incremental demolition of the US economy they're almost at the end of the road now but I want to ask the question that is there a military trap as well maybe that's why Russia and China did not vote veto the first revolution re resolution on Libya that there's a trap being set for the United States and as they move in they'll find themselves in a military situation where they're going to be facing embarrassing defeat because they're overextending themselves overreaching and then to save the United States Israel will have to intervene in the same way that to save Britain the United States had to intervene I leave you with these thoughts what we've done tonight is to touch the subject of Syria from our long-term perspective Iran is going to suffer serious consequences if their regime change in Syria Iran will be isolated the attack on Iran is pre-planned I don't think it's because they want to simply destroy the nuclear plants in Iran I think they have a more important perspective that they want regime change in Iran they want a virulently Shia regime in Iran that will become more amenable to building a relationship with Israel the attack on Pakistan is coming and when the attack on Pakistan takes place it will be for the purpose of destroying Pakistan's nuclear plants and dismantling Pakistan's nuclear weapons Israel cannot launch a big wars when Muslims have a weapon that they can use effectively against Israel it follows therefore that perhaps the first attack will be Pakistan given the support that the Pakistan government and the Pakistan armed forces I don't know why Pakistan it should be annoyed with me for this this is facts the Pakistan armed forces have betrayed Allah and his messenger monstrously I'm talking not about the soldiers who love Islam I'm talking about those who control strategic decision making don't come to me and tell me that all the soldiers in the Pakistan armed forces love Islam I know that I know that the Pakistani people love Islam I'm not talking about that I'm talking about those who control decision making in the armed forces and in the government they are the ones who betrayed Allah and his messenger they are the ones who for the last 10 years shamelessly have allowed NATO transit to take all the oil supplies and all the military supplies from the port in Karachi all through Pakistan to Afghanistan to support the killing of our Muslim brothers and sisters and children in Afghanistan thanks to the Pakistan armed forces and Pakistan government and you're going to be annoyed with me for condemning that yes there are many people in Pakistan and the armed forces who love Islam and who detest what has happened but they're not in control what we have done tonight and the time, was, time is now up is to look at this perspective from the look at this subject from the perspective of Islamic eschatology and when you do that you see a pattern emerging a pattern which is showing you Israel inching moving forward little by little towards her eventual objective of launching her big wars and then blaming Islam Islam is now rising up the Arab uprisings Islam is emerging in Egypt because the elections coming and the 
Islam that is rising up in the world today poses a threat to Israel. And we have to do something to save Israel and to save the world from Islam. And that's why we have to launch these big wars. Hmm? These events are coming. And it is time for the ulama to return to the Quran. It is time for the ulama to return to the Quran and to return to Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam and return to ilmu akhiru zaman so that they can understand the reality of the world today and they can explain it to the ummah of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samyul alim wa tub alayna ya mulana innaka anta tawab rahim barahmatika ya arhamu rahimin Ameen May we uh, have the question and answer now? Uh, the question is the demolition of the US dollar connected with some subject of three days. I know nothing about three days. No. What I do know is that Barack Obama is not there by chance. They put him there. They put a black man in the White House. <laughs> And they put the black man in the White House to take blame. <laughs> to be the guinea pig. To take the blame. Because they know what's coming. I guess they're probably waiting for... The US dollar is already finished. It's in ICU. They're keeping it alive. They're waiting for a war, probably. And then they blame the war for it. And the US dollar will then collapse, Wall Street will witness its collapse, and then they will demonetize the US dollar, meaning it's no longer recognized as legal tender. And because so many countries hold stacks of US dollars, you can't buy oil in the world without US dollars. That's unfair, really. So all those US dollars that you're holding will suddenly collapse. China is going to lose most of all. Saudi Arabia is going to be losing a lot. And then they will replace the US dollar with another currency which will have a fraction of the cost. So on every 90, every one dollar that you had, you're probably going to get five cents. White America is going to suffer massively. Black America is not rich. And when white America suffers this massive blow, the United States has a very curious law. In the United States, you're allowed to buy guns. Oh yeah. You can buy as many guns as you want, it's the law. So white America has lots of guns. So when the US dollar collapses, you're gonna have fireworks in the United States. Fireworks, riots, killing, and they're preparing for it. But I don't know about the three days. Any more questions? Is this riot in the Arab world? I'm actually uh, a local which also uh, had noticed some riots. And I want to, to, to ask you whether these uh, riots in Morocco, Tunisia, Yemen, Bahrain, uh, all those countries actually, even in Jordan these days, are uh, pre planned uh, Zionist uh, tactic? Or is it, uh, I mean, like, uh, those uh, riots we have could result in the Islam in the Muslim nation or we have uh, bad results? Okay. There, there is a, there is an analogy. When the summer comes and there is no rain, then the land becomes parched and the grass becomes dry and brittle. And then you know that only one match is sufficient to start off a huge wildfire with thousands and thousands of acres burning and many, many houses being destroyed. Hmm? Only one little spot. So they know 
what they have done to the Arabs through riba causing them to go down and down in poverty and destitution Egypt most of all Egypt is suffering and suffering badly I was a student in Egypt in 1963-64 and at that time when I went to Egypt I was amazed by the poverty in Egypt I am coming out of Trinidad in the Caribbean and the Egyptians say to me shit those were the golden years compared to what we now have so the suffering of the people is so intense it's as though no rain is falling and just one match is enough to start the conflagration so they knew that they knew that and they were waiting for the match it happened in, in, in Tunisia with a young man who yeah. so to say that everything is pre-planned no it is pre-arranged in the sense that you prepared the conditions with no rain falling okay is this beneficial for Israel yes it is why because e elections are going to take place in Egypt in a few months time the Islamic movement is going to win we know that already an Islamic government is going to come to Egypt so-called Islamic government what's the first challenge it will face Gaza these are your brothers in Gaza you have to reach out to help them and then Israel is going to raise the cry of terrorism that Egypt is supporting terrorism you want this so you can launch your big wars while yet declaring that you're only defending yourself go ahead I know what circumstances and when God and God will be will get loose and get break from their if you follow the wrong methodology you will focus on one hadith one solitary hadith in Sahih Muslim which says that after Nabi Isa alayhi salam kills Dajjal فَبَعَثَ Allah, Allah will then send it doesn't say Allah will release no it says Allah will send Gog and Magog and yet there is this belief <laughs> holding on to this solitary hadith that Gog and Magog would not be released until Nabi Isa Islam returns if they're not released then therefore the barrier the radam built by Zulkarnain is still intact and they're behind that barrier built of iron well I say why don't you go and search for it nobody has seen it in 1400 years that barrier was destroyed in the lifetime of the Nabi Muhammad but yet Islamic scholarship is holding on to a solitary hadith using the lazy man's methodology this book explains the subject last question uh, we know that uh, the Dajjal and Masih will not be able to enter Makkah and Medina when he appears in human form Yes. At that time, right? yeah. So how 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 are we going to relate it to current situation? Why is unable to enter? Because it will conquer the rest of the world. Uh, if this this is the child is already in Makkah. Medina now. Oh yes. But not in human form. It is when Israel has completed a day which is like a week then the Jal will enter into our world of space and time ayamikum. at that time he'll be born of Jewish parents who never previously had any children he would be a Jew he grew up to be a young man powerfully built with curly hair and at that time the attack will take place he will attack Makkah and Medina the angels are going to bar him how is he going to come Nabi Muhammad pointed 20 times to the east he's going to come from the east and he could be riding on a 
donkey and the donkey will travel as fast as the clouds and the donkey will have his ears stretched out wide this is a crucial problem now we say that this is religious symbolism and this flying donkey is the modern fighter aircraft but they, the Salafi said, no, no one has the authority to interpret anything of religious symbolism after Nabi Muhammad And so they're waiting for the flying donkey. Okay? And so when Dajjal is in human form, at that time he cannot enter Makkah and Madinah. But at this time, before he enters into, in, in, into our world of space and time, he said to Tamim al-Dari, the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, that when I'm released, because he's still in chains, th this book will explain it to you, I will enter every town and every city. Every town and every city means including KL. But notice he didn't mention Kampung. He didn't mention Kampung. And so we say that there is safety for us, for our faith, for preservation of faith, safety in getting out of the cities and moving to the remote countryside. Number two. The army which is going to liberate the Holy Land is not going to come out of KL. <laughs> no. That army will comprise of people who have no fear of death. I read a work, I'm reading a work about the Islamic resistance in Mindanao. How many centuries they fought and they defeated Spain in Mindanao. And the American writer who wrote about this history, he said about these Mujahideen in Mindanao, what was remarkable about them was none of them had any fear of death. None. Hmm? You can't produce that kind of people today. Men with backbones made of steel who fear none but Allah. And who are not afraid of that? You can't produce that today in the modern city. You gotta go back to Kampum, go back to the remote countryside and build a life which is free from the attacks of Dajjal. And these are the people who will liberate the Holy Land. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka inta samiul alim wa tawa alayna ya mawlana inna ka inta tawa rahim bi rahmatika ya ahamar rahmin And so now let us look at the world today in which we have these mysterious Arab uprisings taking place. And look to the Quran and to he who was sent to teach the Quran for that which explains. We have our brother Jamaluddin here with us tonight. Some five months ago at the University of Malaya, he organized my first lecture on an Islamic view of the current Arab uprisings and today we are updating that subject because of the events which have occurred since then we will pause for this Azan of Salat al-Isha and then we'll continue for some time after that and then we'll have a question and answer session with the permission of the Imam and then we'll have the Salat al-Isha inshallah was it by accident that one people, one Christian people, launched jihad, yes, jihad, to liberate the Holy Land. They call it the Crusades. They were holy wars, so jihad. No other Christians joined them in it. And on their way from Europe to the Holy Land, they fought against their own Christian brothers, 
the Byzantine Eastern Orthodox Christians what is it that explains Europe's obsession with liberating the Holy Land is it by accident or does it form part of a bigger plan the Crusades continued for hundreds of years until eventually when General Allenby entered into Jerusalem at the head of a British army and with Muslims fighting in that army defeating the Ottoman Islamic Empire General Allenby entered into Jerusalem in October or November 1917 and declared today the Crusades have ended in other words a modern secular Britain was still pursuing a holy war launched by a Pope a Roman Catholic Pope in Rome what is it that explains is this an occurrence that is happening by accident and then after that Britain issued the Balfour Declaration that is the intention of the British government to work for the establishment of a Jewish national home in the Holy Land is this by accident and then after that Britain becomes the mandate power controlling the Holy Land and during that time between 1918 and 1948 for 30 years the Jews are allowed to return to the Holy Land not Banu Israel Banu Israel are still in Yemen and in Iraq and in Iran Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi alladhina astafa khususan ala afdalihim wa khatamin nabiyyin Muhammadin al-Amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba' fa'a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim wa nazzalna alayka al-kitaba tibiyanan likulli shay wa hudan wa rahmatan wa bushra lil muslimin sadaqallahu al-azim we begin with Allah's blessed name we praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the blessed prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam respected imam brothers and sisters assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I believe this is the first time for me to be here in Masjid al Ghufran in Taman Tun Dr. Ismail in Kuala Lumpur I thank you for your kind invitation to speak to you tonight on a subject which is of importance to all of us there are strange things happening in the world and we need to understand the world today and if we do not turn to our sources for that understanding the enemy is going to brainwash us with all kinds of false explanations and understandings and so tonight we look at the topic from Libya to Syria to Imam al Mahdi alayhi salam or from Tripoli to Damascus to Imam al Mahdi alayhi salam. The reason why we have included Imam al Mahdi is because we want to highlight our approach to the subject that we are looking for at this subject from the perspective of the Quran and of the Ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam and in particular in the light of what you call Ilmu 
akhiru zaman <coughs> and so let us turn now to our subject from Tripoli to Damascus to Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam we said that strange things are happening in the world and in Surah Al-Nahl of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks and this is what he says وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ And we have sent down the book, the Quran Sent it down on thee, O Muhammad Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam Tibiyanan likulli shay That this book, and in Morocco no, 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 these are white people who become Jews. They have no genetic links at all with Arabs. They're not cousins of the Arabs. They're not from Ishaq alayhi salam. And the Arabs are from Ismail alayhi salam. And so genetically linked as cousins. No. These European people have no genetic links whatsoever with Banu Israel, but they're Jews. And when in 1948 a state of Israel was born in the Holy Land, and the Jews now recover Jerusalem as their own, is this happening by accident? And then from 1948 to this date, first of all it was Britain who supported and protected the state of Israel. And then the United States of America took over. And Israel grows and grows and grows in strength. Until Israel today is a superpower. Is this happening by accident? Shall we simply eat roti chanai and go home and go to sleep? Is that what Allah gave us a rational faculty for? Or is there some explanation for it? And we say that there is an explanation. Not only are these events occurring in the Holy Land, but they could not have occurred unless Europe had experienced a strange a mysterious scientific and technological revolution that was absolutely unique in human history nothing to compare with it one people deliver to the world and are continuing to deliver to the world this mysterious scientific and technological revolution which gives them a power that none can rival is this happening by accident? And then they apply that power to military technology. And they attack at the point of a sword. And they occupy. And they colonize the rest of the world. And they destroy the Khilafah. Oh, but the Khilafah is a part of Islam. Is this happening by accident? And they do not decolonize until they have done some work. They take the money that Allah gave to us. The money that is the sunnah. Sunnah money. The gold and silver coins, the dinar and dirham. They take it out of the market. They establish an international monetary fund. And they make it in that fund prohibited for anybody to use gold and silver as money not even Dr. Mahathir knew that and they replace it with this bogus this fraudulent and this utterly haram paper currency is this happening by accident and the paper money functions as a vehicle for the massive exploitation of the wealth of the masses and so part of the world now becomes fantastically wealthy and the rest of the world growing poorer and poorer. Is this happening by accident? 
Who are those who are growing wealthy? Like you know, little Israel around the corner there, Singapore. Those that are growing wealthy are those who support the state of Israel. Whether they do it openly as Singapore, or they do it secretly as Saudi Arabia, they are the supporters of Israel. And so they are on the gravy trade. They live well. They are growing more and more wealthy. And who are those who are growing poorer and poorer? Those in whose hearts there is faith in Allah. Sincere faith in Allah. Those who will never bow their head to oppression. Like Indonesia. Like Bangladesh. Like Pakistan. Like Egypt. Like the Turkish countryside, not the Turkish cities. They grow poorer and poorer and poorer. Is this happening by accident? And not only do they give us this revolution in the world of finance, but the revolution also in the market. We never had riba. We used to have a few money lenders lending money on interest and people despise them. And they give to us a banking system. And that banking system now lends money on interest. And not only lending on interest in order to grow wealthy at the expense of others, but no. When you read John Perkins' book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, you know that sometimes they lend you money on interest to enslave you. Even a schoolboy knows that now. Are these things happening by accident? There's also a revolution in our social life. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, the time would come when women would be dressed and yet be naked. Has that come today? Is it happening by accident? Well then what is the explanation for these mysterious events which are unfolding in the world today? And therefore what is the explanation of the Arab uprising? They call it the Arab Spring in which we have had the events of Tunisia and the departure of the President uh, Zainuddin bin Ali with that uprising, popular uprising. And then, what's his name now? We've forgotten it, eh? the Egyptian one. <laughs> Hosni Mubarak. In the popular Egyptian uprising. And now we see uprisings taking place in other parts of the Arab world as well. What is going on? What is the explanation? might explain all things. There has never been a stranger world than the dunya in which we are now living. And if we do not turn to the Quran for the explanation of this dunya today, we are going to suffer serious consequences for that. And in this Quran, there is guidance. How should we live in this world? How should we respond to events which are mysteriously unfolding in the world? For example, it's an open secret. Even schoolboys now know it. That the US dollar is about to collapse. But we've been saying that for the last 15 years. Where did we get that knowledge from? Is it that there is an angel coming to whisper in our ears? <laughs> or is it a jinn? No. <laughs> we knew that the US dollar will collapse. That it has to collapse. It must collapse. Because of our study of Ilmu Akhirul Zaman, or what is called Islamic eschatology. In this Quran there is guidance. How do we respond?
to this chaotic world of money. And now everybody minting dinar and dirham. Even the Chinese non-Muslims are din minting dinar and dirham now in Penang. No? Fifteen years ago, ours was a voice in the wilderness. Hmm? That explanation and that guidance in the Quran has come as rahmah from Allah. And woe unto those who do not turn to the Quran and accept that rahmah. But those who do, and who locate it and who follow it, bushra lahum, good news and glad tidings for such people who are so faithful to the Book of Allah. For they will understand what others cannot. New faith times will be the last to understand. <laughs> And they will succeed when others will not. We pay a price when we do not turn to the Quran. In Surah Al Furqan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places these words on the lips of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam. With Surah, Surah Al Furqan. بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وقال الرسول and the messenger of Allah said Ya Rab O oh my Rab my Lord God إن قومي surely my people that's you and I إن قومي تخذوا هذا القرآن مهجورا surely my people have forsaken this Quran. Surely my people have abandoned this Quran. That's a terrible complaint 